your normal practice. So the purpose of tonight, when we talk about monotheism in the Old Testament, what are we endeavouring to achieve? Well, it's not to shock uh, or upset, but rather to actually sit back and think as to how did God deal with people way back, you know, in ancient time. And hopefully what we're going to see is the tremendous patience and largeness of our God, his tolerance of people and willingness to work with them to bring them to truth. And um, we're, we're going to explore that um, piece by piece. Um, and first of all, I think we'll probably talk about, um, you know, how that Bible um, relates to culture. But firstly, you know, um, I need to hit this clicker. Um, how do we read? Right? And this is one of the challenges that Jesus threw out to the religious experts of his day quite often when he was in disputation with them. And as he said to them in John 5, verse um, 39, you study the scriptures because you think in them you possess eternal life, but they actually testify about me. You know, they were honing in on so much detail that they missed the big picture. They actually missed the Son of God. Right? And it's possible for us when we come to the scripture to dive in um, and, and go into so much detail, but sometimes our magnifying glass is just us looking for what we want to find rather than stepping back and hearing what scripture is actually saying to us. So we have to be careful about our preconceptions, right? And, you know, we need to be prepared to grow and to be challenged by scripture and some of the ideas in there. Now, an important point I just... Um, would like to make, because I think it's critical in how we approach um, scripture and how we approach tonight. We need to recognise, uh, this uh, quote's not me, it's too clever for me, a guy called John Walton, he's written a whole series of books, many of which are, are fantastic, um, but just, you can read it and I'm not going to, but the comment that I've highlighted there, that scripture was written um, for us, it wasn't written to us, right? Scripture was written at a very different time and place and culture uh, is just as important as language. None of us read Hebrew, at least I don't think anyone here reads Hebrew. Um, that's foreign to us, but so also is the culture. If you had asked Abraham if you could just, like, hotspot his Wi-Fi, right, you would have got an odd reaction, and he was a very hospitable person, right? If you had asked him about the stock market or a democratic elections in the US or international travel or a whole host of things that we just take for granted just weren't part of their world and their worldview. Individualism, the education, literacy, so many things that we just take for granted were not how they operated. And those things can impact um, at a very personal um, level as well. Um, marriage has been going on for 6,000 years. We assume that we know what marriage is like. It's, it's always been the same, right? You know, one man, one wife. Yeah, but um, my parents, they got close, but they didn't quite have to get to the point where they needed to arrange my marriage. But that was pretty much a standard thing, right? And, you know, no dowry was paid with Sarah. Would have been useful, right? <laughs> um, so even simple things like marriage that we read about someone being married and we think, oh, well, we know what that's about, but actually, no, there's a very different dynamic in Scripture as to what that meant for them in their time and place. All right, so things that appear to be familiar might actually be different in important ways. Now, an example of that. Right? Um, this is the uh, first official, there were a few black market copies that came out, but the first official find in a proper archaeological dig of King Hezekiah's personal seal. Okay? Um, and it says there, as I'm sure, bother, I'm sure you can't read uh, the letters any more than I can, so hopefully they've been translated uh, as Hezekiah, uh, assumed son of Ahab, um, king of Judah. All right, so this is his personal seal on the signet ring, you know, pushed into clay to sign official documents. Now, we know King Hezekiah from the Old Testament, right? He was an incredibly zealous religious reformer for Yahweh. He went through and he removed idols, he destroyed idols, he got rid of false worship in his kingdom and beyond. He was incredibly passionate about there's one God, you only worship one God. This is his personal signature. And I'm using it as a demonstration of how their expectations and culture is different to ours, right? We're monotheistic, we just worship the one God. Does your personal signature include you know, a flying sun disc, um, which was a 
symbol throughout the entire region of divine protection and health that was used in, in all the local superstitions and pagan idolatry. I bet you don't have that in your personal signature. And that's not the only thing. If you look uh, slightly more to the side, you can see here this symbol, and I'm going to pronounce it terribly, I think it's called an, an ankh. It was an Egyptian symbol for life. And again, divine blessing. So that's a piece of Egyptian superstition that Hezekiah, the zealous one God, the God of Israel, nobody else, is putting in to every single time he signs his name on any official document. Right? So our expectations and how we operate in terms of there is one God, one God only, might be a little bit different, perhaps, to some of the way that these people that we read about thought and operated. Again, I might be wrong. You might have an incantation to bail in your personal signature as you go to the bank, but I seriously doubt it. Okay? But Hezekiah had this kind of thing. So it's a little bit different. And Scripture deals with these people in their culture and in their time. And we note that with some simple examples. Right? So right through Scripture, from start to finish, um, in Hebrew and in Greek, uh, the Bible talks about the heart as if it was the brain. And we just go, oh yeah, we're cool with that because we understand God's accommodating their misunderstanding of biology and, and that's okay. And there's a myriad of other examples from demons or, or whatever it is, right? Tonight we're going to see a few other examples that perhaps go in areas which we might find a bit more sensitive and that's good because the question that I hope it will prompt in our minds is if God can deal with people like this uh, in this incredibly sensitive, accommodating way, well, he hasn't changed, so he'd be dealing with us the same way. And maybe we should deal with each other in a similar kind of way as well. You know, there, there are some real questions for us to think about. I, I want to put a, a passage that we're probably familiar with for different reasons and just unpack it and, and use it a slightly different way. Matthew chapter 19, verse 7 to 8. You might want to turn it up. It's where the Lord's having a disputation with the religious experts about marriage and divorce. And we're not going to talk about marriage and divorce and remarriage because I don't need that. Um, but we're going to unpack it and look at some of the mechanics of what Jesus is saying and some of the implications because, well, I just want you to think about the implications of what he says. In verse 7 and 8, so the religious experts say to him, look, Moses said to us, and they're, they're referencing back to Deuteronomy 24, um, Moses said to us, if you want to get divorced, that's okay, write out a bill of divorcement, you know, make it all official and get divorced, no problem. And Jesus said, yes, um, it's because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it wasn't so, God intended one man, one woman, together, that's it. Okay, we're not, as I said, we're not going into talking about um, marriage, divorce, remarriage. I just want you to think about what on earth is Jesus saying here? Put it to you another way and I'll, I'll spin the, the words around fractionally differently. God always intended one man, one woman. That was the highest, best expression of his principles and objectives. But because of you humans and your frailty and your hardness of heart, he made a divine, inspired allowance in the law so you could do something other than the best. Yeah? It's kind of what Jesus is saying, right? So when we come to, you know, passages, it's like, whoa, well, hang on, we need to be conscious of this potential because Jesus appears to be saying here that there's times where at least the law doesn't reflect the highest, best ideal but is accommodating human weakness. Right? That's probably not how I would have answered questions when I, was getting, um, when I was going through for baptism, but it's what Jesus appears to be saying here, right? worth thinking about. We're going to keep thinking. Um, so if this Bible was not written to us but for us, and if at times it accommodates human weakness in the way that it expresses itself or sometimes the principles, we need to, uh, perhaps we can see this as God leading us a little bit like, you know, a rubber band. You know, if you pull on a rubber band too hard, you're not going to move the other finger. You're just going to, you're just going to snap your rubber band. 
Matthew 19 unlocks a whole lot of interesting ideas. How does God work with his people and revelation, inspiration, to lead people where he wants them to get from where they are? And sometimes he clearly, as Jesus says, he made allowance for their weakness. He didn't take them straight to the end point. I guess it talks to the patience of God a little bit there too, doesn't it? That he makes those sorts of allowances. Okay, let's move on. Um, the city of Ugarit is one of the most important archaeological discoveries that was made in the 20th century. It was found in about 1924. What's incredible about this site, it's got an ancient history. It was originally settled in 7000 BC in the Neolithic age and it was continuously inhabited up until about 2200 BC and then everyone walked away. No one knows why. But about 200 years later, they got back there and started up again and it continued until 1400 BC, give or take, right? So for 600 years and then was destroyed and lost to history. So it's a time capsule. Great, where is it? Well, it's just north of Israel, right? And at 1400 BC, you'd be thinking, ah, that's about when Israel started to emerge in the land of Canaan, and you'd be right, right? That's the end of the Bronze Age, right? Remember David and the Philistines? The Philistines had iron, the Israelites didn't. It was the end of the Bronze Age, things were evolving. This is the point of time at which Ugarit ceases to be sealed in, and in 1924, we find all this treasure trove of goodies, clay tablets that describe what Canaanite culture was like. So uh, we know more um, about Baal from this site um, than we do from anywhere else outside of the Bible, and the Bible doesn't actually tell us too much about um, Baal. Now, Baal, uh, I believe technically is, should be pronounced Baal, but um, the God of Lightning's not that operational anymore, so we're safe just to say Baal because we all know what that means. Let me give you a little bit of the story of Baal as we know it um, from Ugarit, okay? And I'm going to summarise widely and take out all the juicy bits because there might be children watching at some point. But basically the story of Baal, there's a few missing bits, but basically the story goes like this. Um, Ael, or El, was the supreme god, and he was the creator god. He had three children. Baal was one, uh, Yam, who was the sea god, and Mot, who was the god of death. So three children. And then there's all these other kids, um, generally, who are referred to as the sons of El, right, or the sons of God. Um, and they form the divine assembly, the divine council, the throne room, all this sort of thing, right? Anyway, it gets to a point that El decides he wants to step back from the day-to-day -day running of the world and everything, and he decides he's going to appoint Baal as his successor, right? So he's still going to be the president, if you want, but Baal's going to be the prime minister and do all the admin and stuff, right? I'm not sure if it was a paid role or volunteer role. That's something that we could sort out. Um, this is all good. Everyone's quite happy with this, but um, Yam, the god of the sea, and Yam in Hebrew, actually, is the word for sea as well, which we'll note a little later. Um, Yam, the sea god, very unhappy with this, and he sends some of his servants, these um, mythical dragon uh, demon beasts, to threaten the assembly of the gods and demand that they hand over Baal as a hostage to get killed. Everyone's terrified. Right? The gods apparently are pretty weak. Um, Baal is also quite scared, but fortunately he gets given two magic weapons, thunder and lightning. Very, very frightening. Uh, he uses those, he goes and fights against Yam, the god of the sea, and he wins. You beauty comes back, says to his father El, you need to build me a palace now because, you know, I'm the man, I need a palace. El goes, fair enough, builds a palace, bang, throws a big opening party, uh, invites everybody along, Yam now comes along, uh, also invites his other brother Mot, the god of death. Mot now, you know, kicks up a bit of a temper tantrum and says, no, I'm not coming. Uh, in fact, I'm going to kill you. Everyone's very scared. They try and trick Mot, the god of death, by getting a bull, dressing up in Baal's clothes. Baal must have been a large bloke. And um, you know, Mot kills that, but quickly realises it didn't really look like a god. It looks more like a bull. Anyway, eventually he catches Baal, kills Baal. Everyone gets very sad because there's no rain, because Baal's the god of rain. 
Uh, and eventually, no one can really make any headway and get Bale back. So Bale's mum, who was a mean piece of work, she goes to confront Mott. Um, things don't go well for Mott. And Bale's body is brought back. The gods all cut themselves with knives because they're very sad. The blood falls on the ground, falls on Bale. He miraculously comes back to life and there's rain again and it's all good. And Mott decides he's not going to be naughty again because mum's a tough piece of work. That's kind of the story of Baal. And you go, oh, great, Daniel, Bible class, why do I need to learn about Baal? Well, because Baal was a fundamental part of Old Testament culture, right? You have to remember, Baal was the dominant religion, right? The worship of the God of Israel was a minority upstart position that was continually um, pushing back against the dominant religion, which was the religion of Baal and Asherah, Baal's wife. Okay. So that story is fundamental to, well, the lives of pretty much everybody, particularly early in the New Testament, right? Judges and the kings, the story of Baal was, was what they knew. And it comes out in Scripture. So think about, and we're not going to dive hard into um, Elijah's work, right? But he's clearly confronting um, Baal. First to Kings 17, how does Elijah announce himself? There'll be no rain except for my word, says Yahweh. Baal's the god of rain. Right? So here's Elijah staking out the ground, going, no, that's not Baal's power, this is Yahweh's power. Right? He brings the rain and there won't be rain. Three and a half years. Then he meets on Mount Carmel and they have the contest. Look what Elijah does on Mount Carmel, right? In First to Kings chapter 18. What's the sacrifice? It's a bull. Well, that's fundamentally part of the Baal story. And how are you going to prove you're a god? You're going to bring down fire from heaven, lightning, to light up the sacrifice. That's Baal's core thing, right? So Elijah sets up the contest and he says, all the home ground advantages are going to go to Baal, right? There's going to be no question about fake news, fake votes. No, no, you have all the advantages here and we're going to demonstrate, right? And what do the prophets of Baal do? when they start to get a little bit desperate. They cut themselves with knives. Well, that's part of their theology. That's their story, right? It wasn't that someone went, hey, here's a wacky idea. Let's try something different. No, no, that's part of the entire Baal cycle, right? Um, When Elijah sits there and he's absolutely mocking, right, sitting there going, oh, maybe Baal's on a journey. Well, Baal went on a journey every year, of course, because some of the rain stopped, but Baal always came back. And here's Elijah just poking, well, maybe he's gone on a long trip this time. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's not here anymore. He's poking at them, right? But he's poking at them using their own story, okay? And um, interesting piece through the, entire, uh, which, uh, through the entire contest, which we'll pick up later. What was the big question of the day that Elijah puts to them? Who are you going to serve, Baal or Yahweh? How would you put that question? <coughs> you would put it a bit different wouldn't you? Because we are clearly monotheistic. We don't believe that there is any Baal. So we would say you need to start worshipping Yahweh and stop all this superstitious nonsense that's a figment of your imagination. Elijah doesn't say that. It's not a question of does Baal exist? It's a question of which God are you going to be loyal to? The answer unquestionably, you should be loyal to Yahweh, the God of Israel, right? It's not really a very monotheistic position that Elijah's putting there but he's talking in their language and their culture because they're profoundly polytheistic. Now, we read tonight from Psalm 29. Flick up Psalm 29, and I want you to reread Psalm 29 quietly to yourself, and I'm just going to point out a couple of things. And you tell me what sounds kind of vaguely familiar. Verse 1 starts off um, addressed to the sons of El, the sons of God or the sons of gods. Um, Verse 3, God has power over the waters, power over yam. Verse 3, his voice is like thunder. Baal's voice is thunder. Um, Seven times this voice comes through in the psalm. Um, The place names, Lebanon, that's up north. Does anyone know where Syrian is? Probably not. Herman. But why Syrian? 
Syrian is actually the Sidonian name, right? So it's using, it's actually not traditional standard Hebrew language for this place. It's northern people's language for the place. Um, Look at verse 7, fire, lightning. Verse 9, in his temple they're saying glory. Verse 10, he's enthroned over the waters. You can take this psalm and replace Yahweh with Baal and it fits perfectly. So much so that the question has been debated for some time as to whether this is actually a psalm for Baal that someone has got the you know, ancient version of liquid paper for and repurposed, renamed it, right? Because it perfectly fits as a psalm to Baal. Now, some conservative commentators are uncomfortable with that uh, and so they say, no, 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 what we have here is merely, merely a theological appropriation, right? Um, Yahweh is, is getting given all the powers of Baal, but it's Baal language, it's Baal place names, it's, it's all Baal, right? Now, I'm not suggesting Baal's a real thing, but clearly in this psalm, what you've got is... You know, that line has been a little bit blurred. Either we're reusing a Baal psalm or we are deliberately writing Baal out of the picture and instead stamping Yahweh very deliberately over all of Baal's powers. You you might say heads, you might say tails on that because I can't be um, definitive as to which it is. But it's certainly interesting that that language is being used and that's the dominant culture again. Right, we need to remember, worship of Yahweh was the upstart new kid on the block. Um, the cloud rider. One of the titles of Baal was that he was the cloud rider, the rider on the storm. I wanted to play the doors, but it probably wouldn't fit. Um, this is what Baal did. He rode clouds. Now, can you think of any passages in Scripture where Yahweh rides clouds? Yeah, there's heads nodding. Okay, Um, Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1. Here's a message about Egypt. Look, the Lord rides on a swift-moving cloud and approaches Egypt, right? Yahweh suddenly is the cloud rider. Psalm 68. Psalm 68 has, um, is is probably fairly well known. Verse 4, um, sing to the Lord, sing praises to his name. Exalt the one who rides upon the clouds, for the Lord is his name. Everybody else in the audience, when they first heard that psalm, if they weren't, you know, Uh, an upstanding member of the congregation, extol him that rideth upon the clouds by his name, Baal, Yahweh. Right? So he's grabbing a title of Baal and handing it over to Yahweh, taking that. Um, Verse 7 of Psalm 68. O God, when you led your people into battle, when you marched through the desert, the earth shakes, the heavens pour down rain for the God of Sinai before God, the God of Israel. O God, you cause abundant showers to fall on your chosen people. See, that's Baal's job, right? But the psalmist is saying, no, this is Yahweh who's doing this. It's not Baal, right? So it's a very deliberate grabbing of that. And there are other passages in Scripture where, um, you know, we talk particularly about um, Yahweh enthroned on the flood or king over the waters, king over the oceans. Um, Psalm 93 um, is, is one example of that. And the Hebrew um, is, is actually the same word, yam. Uh, it's just a, a general noun as opposed to a proper name, right, um, of the god yam. So these declarations of God's power uh, of controlling the sea, it's absolutely picking up the language and the, so, uh, the imagined powers of Baal. There's some other pieces, though, that go a little bit further, right? So it's not just about appropriating the powers. There's also some mm, mythical creatures, Um, that come out of the Baal cycle into Scripture in some really interesting ways. Okay, let's have a look at Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1. And um, what's reasonably close in English um, when you get into the uh, Semitic languages, because they're um, incredibly closely related, is essentially identical. So in Isaiah 27, uh, or you can read it at the time, the Lord will punish with his uh, destructive, great and powerful sword, Leviathan, the fast-moving serpent, Leviathan, the squirming serpent, and he will kill the sea monster. 
Isaiah is quoting almost exactly from a section of the Baal epic, which talks about Baal in his battle over Yam, the sea, um, the sea god, um, killing Letan, who was the demonic uh, sea monster that served Yam, right? And Loch Ness monsters and great sea monsters and stuff, it's been a common across many cultures to imagine these horrendous, powerful beasts out in the ocean. And that was certainly the case in Cana, right? But Baal killed um, the sea monster, the sea dragon. And uh, you can see that the, the Letan is the name uh, in, the, uh, in the Baal epic, and that's changed to Leviathan in scripture. Interesting, um, Isaiah does something else which isn't immediately apparent. Um, he throws on at the end of uh, verse 1, he will kill the sea monster, and the Hebrew word there is tannin. Yeah, great, that's really useful. Well, tannin was the Mesopotamian, the Babylonian myth sea dragon, right? Because these stories across the region are very, very similar. Now, the Bible, of course, is written in Cana. It's much, much more aligned with the Baal stories, but elements of the Mesopotamian story were similar and come in. And so Isaiah picks up and says, well, it wasn't Baal that killed the sea dragon, the sea monster. Um, it was actually Yahweh who killed Leviathan, the sea monster, and your Mesopotamian tannin monster, same thing, Yahweh killed them all. all. right, so it was God who did this. Scripture ties this together again somewhere else. Psalm 74, let's go to Psalm 74. This one is probably more challenging again, because this does some very interesting things. Psalm 74, verse 13. Um, you destroyed the sea, Yam, by your strength. You shattered the heads of the sea monster, Tanin, it's the Mesopotamian monster as well, in the water. Now, question, right? I don't know if anyone knew the answer to this before, but you should know the answer now. How many heads does Leviathan have? Because it says clearly in verse 13 that you shattered the heads of the sea monster, plural. How many heads does Leviathan have? Seven. We know that. Because Letan, Leviathan, has seven heads. That's what the Baal cycle clearly tells us. Right? That plural heads made absolutely no sense to anybody until, it was assumed to be an error, until we found the Baal cycle and went, ah, okay, seven heads. Interesting. And if we read this section here, I'll, I'll just read it, and unfortunately it doesn't quite work in English, but... Um, you destroyed Yam by your strength. You shattered the heads of the sea monster, Tannin, in the water. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You fed him to the people who live on the coast. You broke open the springs and streams. You dried up perpetually flowing rivers. You established the cycle of day and night. You put the moon and sun in place. You set up boundaries of the earth. You created the cycle of summer and winter. A couple of things going on there. Firstly, according to one scholar, and I don't have the skill to verify this, um, the word you being used of Yahweh acting occurs seven times in this passage, which they suggested, hmm, maybe there's a deliberate poetic alignment with the seven actions of Yahweh and destroying the seven heads of Loathan. Maybe. Probably beyond our capability to know now. Um, but when does this happen? All of this destruction of Leviathan. If we read through verse 14 to 17... That's Genesis 1 kind of language. Now, some people try very hard to squeeze it into a creation of Israel at the Red Sea type piece. There's a fair bit of squeezing to do there. The simple plain reading is this is Genesis 1 kind of timing. So the psalmist is saying that you killed Leviathan, you crushed Leviathan um, at the time of creation. Now, the interesting piece about that is that's exactly what happens in the Babylonian myths with the destruction of Tannin, the sea monster. In fact, let's have a little bit of a look. Unfortunately, we're missing a piece of the Baal cycle, which is the piece that occurs just here. So we don't quite know what Baal did after he killed, Le after he killed Letan, Leviathan. But the, uh, the similar story in Mesopotamia does have that detail. And so what happened? Well, I'll just read it, a little bit of it for you. Um, 
Again, a very similar story. You've got Marduk, who's uh, on his way to being promoted into being the chief god, the same as Baal was on his way to promotion. Uh, just so happened that the favourite god of the Babylonians was Marduk, so lucky for them, their guy was the one who was promoted to chief god. I'm sure that was a fluke. Um, and he also has a fight with the sea and has to kill the dragon beast, which is controlled by the sea. See if you can hear any similarities. This is, this is, their, um, this is part of their, their epic. Then with cunning, he divided her trunk. He split her like a flat fish into two halves. One half he set up and made a covering for the heavens. And he drove in a bolt and stationed a watch and bade them not allow her waters to issue forth. Then he established the heavens as a counterpart to the world below and set over it the ocean, the dwelling of um, Nadimud. And, you know, he did a whole lot of other stuff, which was great. And the great palace, Eshera, which he built as the dome of heaven. And he made Anu, Bel and Ea take up their several abodes. A lot of similarity there with Genesis 1 and the firmament, right? A physical structure in the sky that's holding back waters and is the place of the heavens, right? So some of these ideas appear to have worked their way across um, into Scripture. And it's, it was often thought that there were some very, very direct connections between Genesis 1 and these Babylonian epics. Um, recent scholarship is moving away from that, if anything, um, they tend to downplay deliberately um, the Babylonian stories. Um, so in the same way that uh, the sun and the moon are just described as lights, they're not given any real names because they're getting downplayed. Um, similarly, in Genesis 1, if you remember, God says, um, you know, he made the fish and he made the great sea creatures, right? So it's very much, um, you know, Yahweh saying, you know, don't be afraid of all those pieces. They're not demonic animals controlled by the gods. They're actually just stuff that I made. Right? So I think that's a very deliberate swipe that's occurring uh, in Genesis 1 there. But, um, yes, as it is, you still have the, the sea monsters mentioned and being um, demythologised. Um, this is a picture of the, the Babylonian epic, um, the dragon. Uh, he only has one head. Oops. There we go. Sorry. Um, but can you see what Marduk is carrying in his hand? Right. He's got lightning. Right. So, so there's a lot of common elements between these stories. So he's taking lightning as, as one of his secret weapons to, uh, to tame his particular dragon. And something about the dragons, as we said, in the story of Baal and also in the Babylonian epic, that all the gods were terrified. I'll read a bit from the Mesopotamian creation epic. Speechless was Anshar as he stared at the ground, hair on edge, shaking his head at ear. All of the gods gathered at the place, their lips closed tight. They sat in silence. No god, they thought, can go to battle and face him. Uh, in, in the Baal myth, when the gods saw them, saw the messengers of the sea, the emissaries of Chief River, the gods lowered their heads on top of their knees, even on their princely thrones. Right, so both of these epics have situations where threatened by... The, the dragon, right, who was sent by the sea god, all the gods are terrified. Yeah, okay, so what? Right, excellent, good question. Let's go across to Job 41. Job 41, God's in discussion with Job and pointing out, you know, the tremendous power that he has. And he talks about Leviathan. And there's a tremendous amount of description and people work quite hard um, to try and put Leviathan as being a, a crocodile or whatever else. But when you read what Job 41 says, it doesn't fit with any living creature because no living creature breathes fire for a start. And there's many other verses that, you know, just don't fit an actual animal, um, certainly a, a sea animal. Um, but Job 41 verse 9, depending on which version you're reading from, is a little interesting. I'm going to read from the NRSV because I think this uh, gets it, well, this clearly gets it right. Others struggle a little. Any hope of capturing it, Leviathan, will be disappointed. Were not even the gods overwhelmed at the sight of it? Now, the Masoretic scribes 
um, obscured the sense of the line. They, they vocalised the word L, or the proper name, L, uh, and changed it into unto. And so often you'll read something very, very different uh, in a lot of versions, a much more monotheistic, appropriate uh, translation. But we're dealing with Leviathan, who's been described as created by God. Leviathan is this mythical demon sea dragon monster and in verse 9, there's just a straight reference to the culture and the stories that Job knew. Yeah, all the gods were afraid of Leviathan. What is God actually saying in this passage, right, in this whole piece? Well, you look in verse, uh, I think it's verse 6. Um, he, he has Leviathan, you know, can you put Leviathan on a leash, God says to Job? The implication is, I do. Leviathan is my plaything just a little pet, like a Doberman, right? You're terrified. All your stories of the gods were terrified, but Leviathan for me, nothing, <laughs> right? Put him on a leash. Um, and uh, that's exactly consistent with Psalm 104, verse 26. Um, verse 25, yonder is the great sea, great and wide, creeping things innumerable are there, living things, small and great. Verse 26, there go the ships and Leviathan, that you formed to play in it, right? So all of these myths and epics and stories, right, are just getting wrapped up and God's saying, yeah, I made Leviathan. It just made him to play in the waves, right? So it's picking up the language and the myths of this polytheistic culture and just taking all of that and saying, no, no, this is Yahweh's doing, right? This is Yahweh's play thing. It's not a threat to him. It's a threat to all of these other gods, Right. That's how we need to probably understand it. And, and understand that, um, that Israel was a profoundly polytheistic uh, place. Um, in the 8th and 9th century uh, BC, which is around the time of Hezekiah and then through to Josiah, you've got all these reformations going on. But archaeologists today, 45% of the houses uh, in Jerusalem and surrounds contain one of these figures. That's an Asherah figure. So when Jeremiah says that Jerusalem was full of idols, he wasn't kidding. Nearly half of the houses had idols. That's just how things were, right? And that's how people thought. I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 34 to 35, because this passage, it's actually Sennacherib talking. It's probably a title, not a person, but it doesn't matter. So it's the Assyrian standing outside the gates, railing against, um, railing against, uh, against Yahweh. And, um, you know, obviously they'd been very successful military-wise and he describes, uh, or he's, he's, he's threatening the people and this is what he describes. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sephaim, Hena and Ivor? Indeed, did any gods rescue Samaria from my power? Who among all the gods of the lands has rescued their land from my power? No one. So how's Yahweh going to rescue Jerusalem? So what they did is they had this view of all of these gods. There was never a question of your God's not real. He didn't save you, right? It's just your God is like, you know, the Adelaide Crows right down the bottom of the, the league table and, and my God is working his way up the ladder, right? My God's more powerful than yours. Your God's real, no question, but he's just kind of useless, Right? That's how people thought and talked. Right, and This is how this Assyrian is talking to the people. Right? So it gives us a good insight as to, yeah, this is, this is actually how it worked. Right? All the gods were there, but some were just more powerful than others. And you know, my god might beat up your god. Um, you know, but the idea of a non-god was just not in, their, not in their vocab, not in their mental thinking. And gods turn up in surprising places. You had national gods, you had city gods, and then you'd have family gods, right? So, again, according to the league chart, because if you prayed to the national god, he was busy, right? The city god was a bit more approachable, but he had a lot of stuff on, and so you'd have your family household gods because you were in close relationship with them. They weren't as powerful, but at least they were available, okay? And those gods turn up in some weird places to us, weird places. Um, one place they turn up famously is in David's house, right? Um, remember in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 13, right? 
Um, uh, Saul wanted to kill David. He had spies watching the house and Michal, his wife, pulls off this stunt where she puts the teraphim, the household gods, in the bed. And I go, David was a man after God's own heart. He wouldn't have idols in his house. Well, he did. Well, maybe they were really small ones, like this big, that, you know, Mikhail slipped inside a handbag or something. No, they were big enough that trained killers looked through the windows and saw a figure in bed and thought it was a man. That's not big enough. These were big things. David knew where it was. Houses also were quite small. So you've got a large idol in a really small house. David knew there were household idols in his house. I'm not saying he was worshipping them, but they were there. Interesting. David actually talks about and makes some comments which are unusual by our standards, right? When was the last time that you, uh, that you celebrated that Yahweh, your God, was better than the other available options? You would never say that or do that. But David does, right? Um, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 25 to 26, when he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem, David offers a prayer and he says, Yahweh is great and certainly worthy of praise. He's more awesome than all the gods. Now, if someone said that on a Sunday morning, I reckon we would all, like, gasp. Okay? But our Heavenly Father works with this. He doesn't send down a bolt of lightning compliments of Baal's armoury. Right? He works with David when he says these sorts of things. All the gods of the nations are worthless, but the Lord made the heavens. It's not that they don't exist, it's just they're down on the league chart. Right? The only God worth worshipping is Yahweh. That's a very polytheistic statement, even as it calls for singular loyalty to God. Ignore all of the, all of the, the other gods, only worship Yahweh. Right? But the existence of those other um, divine beings is not being denied. And uh, we'll move quickly onwards. Um, second of Samuel chapter 7, verse 23, right? So much later on, when David's given the promises, he prays to God and he reflects on Exodus, right? On history. In second of Samuel chapter 7, verse 23, you did a great and awesome acts for your land before your people, whom you delivered from yourself, from the Egyptian empire and God's. Now, again, I don't think we would say that because you don't need to deliver anybody from the Egyptian gods because they're not a thing. But David says that, the man after God's own heart. And David's words are consistent with, uh, you know, what was written elsewhere in Scripture. Numbers 33, um, verse 4 says, "'The Egyptians were burying all of the firstborn "'who Yahweh killed among them. "'Yahweh also executed judgment on their gods.'" Right, so Numbers is talking about these Egyptian gods as if they're actually things that God interacted with and beat. In the same way, the Assyrians thought their God was beating up on other gods. Right. Perhaps a little bit challenging, but that's okay. Let's keep rolling. Um, you'll say, no doubt, but there's plenty of... That's actually a section of Deuteronomy, uh, the Shema... Deuteronomy chapter 6, which we will get to in a second. Um, you know, but surely the Bible is very monotheistic. The Old Testament says that there's one God, one God only. Okay. Well, it does, certainly, in many places, but not exclusively necessarily. And let's have a look at a couple of those. Deuteronomy chapter 4, right? Things are not necessarily as neat uh, as we might think uh, completely consistently. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7. Um, in fact, what other nation has a God so near to them as the Lord, our God, whenever we call on him? You think about that, well, surely that's just saying that there's only one God and he happens to be close to us. It doesn't actually say that. Right? The point is that our God is close to us, unlike the other nations. It's not actually that monotheistic. 
Have a look at, um, we, we see some statements that appear to be very monotheistic, and we just want to address these. Verse 35, um, you have been taught that the Lord alone is God, there is no other beside him. Um, verse 39, today realise and carefully consider that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath, there is no other. That's saying that there's only one God, surely. Actually, no, it's not, right? We read it that way because we know that's true and Scripture teaches us that elsewhere. But in this particular context, it's no different to, and we're not going to turn it because time's running, Isaiah 47 verse 8, Babylon says, I am queen and ruler alone. There is no one beside me. It's exactly the same grammatical construction as this. So Babylon wasn't alone. She wasn't the only city and knew that. What she's saying is, there's no one like me. I am without peer, is what that expression means. And again, Nineveh does exactly the same in, in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 15. I am alone, I am the greatest, and there's no one else like me. Well, there is no one else, right? What is meant is, there's no one else like me, right? So that, there's words which, on the face of it, we might read and say, well, that's a monotheistic one God, one God only, nothing else formula, actually, no, it's saying God is without peer, not God is without alternative. Let's, uh, there's a couple of other examples of those, but we're going to, uh, we're, get, we're just going to skip on and ignore them um, because we will run out of time. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, what we read in almost all English versions uh, is, I would suggest, has been cleaned up, cleaned up significantly. So I'll read it first from the King James as a representative of the majority text in its clean state. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, right? And most versions are pretty similar to that in terms of what they say. However, um, that has been whitewashed hard because that's not what the text says if we look at both the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's often gaps and you don't get both of them covering the same passage, but this time we've got them covering the same passage. We have them covering this verse, and I'm going to read it from the New Revised Standard Version, which reflects the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint rendering of this verse. When the Most High apportioned the nations, when he divided humankind, so far the same, he fixed the boundaries of the people, still the same, according to the number of gods. Now, that's a little bit different right there, and you probably spotted it, right? So, what was the basis of splitting up the territories? Well, according to witnesses that predate the Masoretic text by over a thousand years, it was divided according to the number of gods, right? This Canaanite idea of the divine assembly. And that was the basis of splitting up territory. That's really, really different to what Deuteronomy 32 says in most of our versions. That verse never really made much sense to me before. I've got to be honest. Why did God set the boundary of Fiji and Tonga, right, based on the number of the children of Israel in 1400, 1500 BC? didn't quite gel, okay? But then now you read this and you go, okay, this is actually just reflecting the culture and the polytheistic statements and views um, that were around at the time. And um, statements are, are like this are not completely unique to this passage. Uh, Judges 11 verse 24, um, you have the right to take what Chemosh, your God, has given you, but we will take the land all of the land that Yahweh, our God, has given us. All right. That's a very polytheistic statement. Um, and look, you can see other, um, other unusual 
uh, statements in, in Deuteronomy 32. Um, look at verse 16 to 17. They made him, Yahweh, jealous with other gods. They enraged him with abhorrent idols. They sacrificed to demons, not gods, to gods they had not known, to new gods who had recently come along, gods your ancestors had not known about. That's blatantly saying that there are other gods. Now, the text disses these other gods and says, you know, they're not really gods. I mean, some of them are just demons, as if that takes all of our theological objections away, right? Because we're not big on demons. It's a polytheistic statement. And what God is saying is, he's talking to people who live in a profoundly polytheistic world. And so rather than blow up their worldview completely, what he's saying to them is, just worship me alone. Give me your singular loyalty rather than try and teach them that there's no other gods. Right? The other gods are worthless, just worship me. Again, really different to the way that we would express ourselves and think we would not say something like this. Right? But this is what's recorded. Um, we're just going to pick one other uh, example uh, and then we'll try and wrap this up with a bit of a so what. Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24 is a prophecy of inescapable judgment. Now, interesting, Isaiah, of course, is much further on in history. And as you go further through the Old Testament, right, you get more and more monotheistic type statements being made, right, until, you know, ultimately, you, you know, you kind of arrive. But Isaiah 24, really interesting statement. Um, verse 21, the judgment that is, is being prophesied, extends to the host of heaven. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and on earth, the kings of the earth. Right? Now, this is not Elohim being used of human judges. The host of the heavens is being separately judged to the kings of the earth. This is the same as Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. The heavenly assembly. Right? Again, um, Baal cycle or tablets from Ugarit, um, the pagan pantheon um, frequently identifies um, the gods as the host of heaven, as the stars. Right? So this again is this same language. Now whether you say, oh, oh that doesn't mean that Isaiah is specifically acknowledging the existence of other gods, no, but he's certainly out there lamblasting them saying that God is going to judge these other deities. Right? Again, it's very unusual language um, if you are um, strictly monotheistic. Um, and even in uh, quite late in the piece, Jeremiah 48 verse 7, again, the Moabite god Chemosh is described as if he's a real living entity. Right? Moab, you trust in the things you do and in your riches, you too will be conquered and your god Chemosh will go into exile along with his priests and his officials. Right? So again, you've got this same sort of language and again, very Assyrian idea of your God's been conquered, your God comes into exile with you as the people. Right? This is how things worked. So I guess then we ask the question, so what? Well, the Old Testament was not written um, to us. It was written for us. And so there's all, these languages, all this language and all these presuppositions of their culture and their ideas that find their way into the text. Whether it's Yahweh appropriating the powers of Baal or, or things getting repurposed, whether it's talk of other gods just naturally in the conversations of upstanding individuals like David, right? These things happen and are recorded. And I think the remarkable piece um, through all of this is to think about how God actually tolerates that, right? God uses that sort of language to these people as he's, you know, bringing them, uh, bringing them to, to loyalty to him. And I think what it says perhaps to us, just a couple of things maybe to think about, how do we read our scripture, right? And when I say that, I mean the technical exactitude that we might put on how we read, and on how we think about other people's positions, right? 
Again, if David gave a prayer as chairman, like he gave bringing up the ark, uh, I think a few of us would be pretty uncomfortable and might even go and have a bit of a chat to him, right? Which would be brave, but... But there he is in Scripture, the man after God's own heart. I think it says something as to how God works with us and how perhaps we should uh, think about uh, work with others. And think about the patience and love of God. You know, there's a lot of times where we have significant differences in opinions on things. Not hard to imagine that God has, well, we know, has a very strong view um, about he is God and there is nothing else. There are no other divine entities. And yet we have these instances through the Old Testament where that's not what people are saying. And God continues to work with them. I think that tells us quite a bit about our Heavenly Father. So, look, hopefully that's um, just given some, some thought-provoking material. Um, I've certainly found it um, pretty challenging. Uh, it's, as I said, a lot of it quite different to what we might have uh, said or what I would have said uh, going through for baptism. But as we explore the scripture and look to grow and, and see these things, uh, I think it gives us an interesting insight into our God. Thank you.